Hello and welcome to the Mental Health Big Club podcast with your hosts Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that we will be covering a diverse range of mental health topics that may be distressing to some listeners. You can find a full list of the topics being covered in each episode in the show notes. Please check the show notes before listening to any of our episodes. Welcome to the Mental Health Book Club podcast with me, Sydney Timmons and Becky Lawrence. And today our book is Sugar, which was written by Deirdre Riordan Hall. Goodreads gave it a 3.93, Amazon.co.uk 4.5 stars from 144 reviews, Amazon.com 4.4 stars from 2,200 customer reviews. Sydney gave this four stars, I gave this three stars. Cool. So as per usual, I think we'll start off with the book blurb just to give you a kind of recap of what the book is about. At that point, we'll then probably go into the story in a bit more detail, talking about the mental health issues that we have identified. And this time, I thought we'd do something a little bit different, which is what I have done is I've looked at all of the different customer reviews that were offering criticisms for this book. And I thought we could talk about those in a bit more depth. How does that sound? It sounds really good. So now for the book blurb. I'm the fat Puerto Rican Polish girl who doesn't feel like she belongs in her skin or anywhere else for that matter. I've always been too much and yet not enough. Sugar Legowski Garcia wasn't always fat, but fat is what she is now at age 17. Not as fat as her mama, who is so big she hasn't got out of bed in months. Not as heavy as her brother Skunk, who has more meanness in him than fat, which is saying something. But she's large enough to be the object of ridicule wherever she is at the grocery store, walking down the street, at school. Sugar's life is dictated by taking care of Mama in their run-down home, cooking, shopping and, well, eating. A lot of eating, which Sugar hates as much as she loves. When Sugar meets Evan, not Evan, his nearly illiterate father misspelt his name on the birth certificate. She has the new experience of someone seeing her and not her body. As their unlikely friendship builds, Sugar allows herself to think about the future for the first time. A future not weighed down by her body or her mother. Soon Sugar will have to decide whether to become the girl that Evan helps her see within herself or to sink into the darkness of the skin-deep role her family and her life have created for her. First things first, Becky has a little bit of an issue with Evan and Evan. So, well, I'm dyspraxic, so my brain cannot cope with this. Okay, it's quite funny. This and, is like the third take or oh something that we've had to try and do this book blurb introduction. And I'm so, really sorry. And Deirdre, if you're out there, please tell me she's out there somewhere. Yeah. I don't know whether she's listening to this, but if anyone knows her as well, we would really love to know why. Why did, I don't understand what it adds to the story or the book that Evan is not just called Evan. Although, to be fair, when I did read it, I just changed it to Evan in my head anyway. Yeah, and reading it's not such a big issue because I did the same. And although it annoyed me sometimes because I do like to read it and think of it uh, the way the author wants you to but at the same time it was so much easier it was so much easier than saying it and trying to remember to say even rather than Evan. Evan um and I don't quite know what it adds to the story in any way that that his father misspelled his name on his birth certificate and I really like the characters in this book and I really like the story and it reminds me a lot of some of the some of the relationship with food and stuff that we've dealt with the and my own mother and how I deal with her um I don't understand what this adds to the story I don't know maybe it's emphasis on the fact that his father is of a lower social economic class I'm not 100% sure yeah but I misspell stuff doesn't mean I'm from a social whatever you said class <laughs> A lower social economic <laughs> class. Oh, my, I'm, I'm really sorry. She's I'm, having issues. She's having issues today. Well, the dyspraxic part of me finds it really hard to distinguish it when I say it. Because t- I think as well, it's one of those things, you know, when on social media, you sometimes get those bits of writing where... You, the, Half the letters are missing. Yeah, or the first <laughs> and the last is right, but the middle's all mixed up. And they or go, they put, if you read yeah. this, you're an, a genius. And I can read those. I can. But don't ask me to read it out loud. Evan and Evan. <laughs> and this is the thing. I think it's one of those things where my, my brain just takes the first and the last and fills in the blanks. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So I'm really sorry. That's the, how I feel about it. And I do have a bit of an issue with it. So maybe let's just say right now, if we get his name wrong, we really are sorry. If we say even or Evan or even Ivan. Yeah, I've said Ivan. It's because I've got a friend, Ivan. 
I don't Sorry. have a friend, Evan, or even. I've got maths teachers' friends. Does they count as evens? <laughs> they might do. You never know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. So anyway, we'll put that out there now. We really mean even if we say Evan, Ivan, or any other kind of <laughs> kind of letter teacher. combination that we can come up with in this podcast. Okay. Um, and if if you are out there, Deirdre, and you are listening, I would love to know why um, yeah. you put that in the book. Maybe we should tweet at her. Yeah, maybe see if we she's will. She's got a Twitter account. Yeah. Anyway, so. I think, as I said before, we'll go through what the story actually is all about because it's not really that descriptive within the book blurb itself. So there is Sugar, that is her nickname, and she was given that because as a child she was found eating sugar out of the bag in her kitchen. So it kind of just stuck. So that's how she became known as Sugar. A bit like her brother's not really called Skunk, is he? No, he's not. It's Again, it's his nickname. <laughs> yeah, so... It is a very interesting story I found that this young girl who is 17 years old and is basically a full-time carer for her mother because her mum has her own mental health issues and as a result of those issues she's eaten and has got to the point where she can no longer get out of bed on her own. So I would assume that this woman would be classified as morbidly obese. Yeah, I think so. And so she spends her time when she's not at school looking after her mother by cooking, cleaning. And her mum's demands for food are not healthy. So she is demanding that she wants fast food. She wants, you know, chocolate bars and things like that. Soda. There's quite a big thing about soda. Soda, yeah. Which obviously being American for if you're an English listener is, uh, you know, fizzy drinks (laughs) rather than soda. (laughs) But yeah, it's... She is always in the bed and she's always shouting and demanding that Sugar waits on her hand and foot. But yet there is none of that for her brother. There's no expectation placed upon her brother. It's purely her mother expecting Sugar to be the one that looks after her. So there's some issues with gender roles, I think. Yeah, and her brother has the same demands, really. So when she is there, her brother wants her to... Look after him. carry for him. And unfortunately in this book, it goes as far as, you know, his friends demanding how she waits on them and to the far where one of them basically sexually assaults her. Yeah, which I think in some ways is skipped over in the book a little bit. But I think that's part of Sugar dealing with it because yeah. it the book is written from Sugar's point of view. Yeah. And I think we're going to come to this later when we talk about some of the criticisms, but I think because it's from her point of view, you have to kind of imagine that 17-year-old conscience of not knowing how to deal with that particular situation. Yeah. And she doesn't feel any sense of self-worth anyway. No. So why would you really feel like this is wrong? Yeah. In some ways, you kind of feel like it's expected that people take advantage of you. Well, I did. And for years, I thought that, that my job was to wait on everybody else because mm. that's the role I had in my family. And so I can really relate to that part of the story with the, the, the where she feels worthless and she's waiting on her family and she, her mother demands so much and she just is living every day. And I think mm. that's the thing with this. I think when you're in that kind of state, you're not thinking about the future. You're not thinking about what comes next. You're just getting through each day. And you do think that that life is your life and mm. that's all you've got. Yeah, exactly. And she deals with that by eating and binge eating. So yeah. it's not just small amounts of food or excess food. It is a case of she'll go to the grocery store and she's thinking about food and she's thinking about getting the best deals. But she's also thinking about if she gets extra cookies or she gets extra Twinkies or I don't know. This book is obviously American for those that haven't necessarily read it yet. But she's constantly thinking about food and how to get that food. Yeah. So it's really... But it's emotional, isn't yeah. it? Her food is linked to her emotions. She feels sad, therefore she eats. Yeah. She Once she's eaten, she feels a bit better for a few minutes, but then she ends up beating herself up because she's eaten so it's kind of like this self-fulfilling spiral of her constantly feeling sad Mm. oh definitely i do think that i did enjoy the story of this book where you know sugar then meets somebody who starts to make her feel like she has worth yeah so she feels a bit more like someone actually is there on her side and paying her attention and we have read recently quite a few books aimed at teenagers and one of the criticisms that I often identify is the fact that in these books it seems that love and relationships can make everything better 
particularly in terms of mental health, as a result of someone paying you attention, all of a sudden, oh, look, I don't have any mental health issues anymore. It's all good. Which it did kind of start off in that kind of direction. Yeah. I know I remember you partway through reading it and I was ahead of you on this yes. one. And you were like, oh, it's just one of those book things. And I was like, yeah, keep with it, keep with it. And Because there is a huge ginormous twist. And at this point we will say, spoiler alert, <laughs> but even is essentially from reading the book it seems like he was sabotaged by skunk whilst they were out on his quad bike yeah and he has an accident and he dies yeah and it's tragic it was really sad i found in the book it was i thought for the author wise a really good twist yes i um, think out for of the, all story, of the ones that we've had yeah. yeah really good twist it wasn't about yeah love conquers all love solves everything and because and- it doesn't, people. <laughs> if it was, it would be so much easier because the world would be such a happy place if we all just, you know, found someone to love and mental health would no longer be an issue, but it's not. Well, you're, you're married, you're in a long-term relationship and that has not solved your mental health issues. No, but it did make him realise that there was something wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas I was pretty much in denial. But that doesn't mean that as a result of me falling in love with it's all someone, rosy. it's all happy now. Because yeah. we're still a regular couple, we still have arguments, we still fight. Yeah. And both of us are currently in therapy. Yeah. So we're still, there's still mental health issues going on. Yeah, and I do think some of the teenage books are the sort of happily ever after kind of, somehow the prince meets the princess like and they get married. Audrey was a bit... Yeah. Like that and some other ones that we've And I suppose are a bit like because that. the audience is teenagers, maybe that's why. But actually when I as a teacher, when but I speak that... well, as a teacher, when I speak to teenagers, I'm often saying to them, Look, sometimes life is crappy and it throws horrible things at you and you you know, you can do all the right thing all the time and still bad things happen to us and yeah. it's not fair and there's no, no right not. there's no wrong. But sometimes the the students that feel that it somehow is gonna be a happily ever after after, it's very hard for them to it's almost harder for them to deal with something when it goes wrong compared to those students that actually accept that life is going to be crappy sometimes and life's going mm. to be good sometimes and you it's just how you deal with it but i also think that it's a role of like different medias as well such as tv and films and stuff yeah. you often find that you've got this disney's happy ever after with the prince charming comes along and scoops up the princess and yeah. All of that kind of stuff. And I don't know, That's those are the messages that we're sending out to children and teenagers as this is what is expected. And yeah. I don't know about you, but that was kind of what my notion of love was in some ways, was this guy would come in or this girl, depending on... How you were feeling. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. And you never know. Yeah. Like, that was how it's meant to be. This no, person true. was meant to come in and fix everything and solve well, It's problems. true, and it's only recently I've come to realise I'm single and have been for a while now. She's single and ready to mingle, <laughs> people. But I've come to realise that actually, you know, if I end up being single forever, it's not the end of the world. And you're not beholden to this other person. You are just a distinct person of yourself. You yeah. have your own personality and so on. And I don't know, I think that sometimes that disappears when you are in a yeah. long-term relationship. Yeah, I do think that's true. I think that's one of the things I worry about when I'm in a relationship that I lose myself. But I also think that it's the expectation that the world puts on you. Oh, definitely. Particularly around Valentine's oh. Day and other Christmas. Yeah. That was also another tricky also, time. Also, just any time you go to weddings a wedding or, or, or any or... family event, I get asked, you know, are you seeing anyone? Oh. And it's, you know, it's that oh it's so sad that you're not when actually I'm pretty happy with my life and I've come to be very contented with what I've got and I I don't need another person I don't need a man in my life to make me happy I can make myself happy but that goes against what society's telling me and what the expectations of everyone else around you yeah and so in this book she does meet even and he it's not romantic it's friendship yes She does wonder whether it will be and not, but then she also then beats herself up and says there's no way. Yeah. But I quite like their friendship. I do too. I think, I don't know, because this is a sample size of me, (laughs) so that's not exactly that big, but I was the fat kid, okay? I was the one that was bullied about my weight. I was the one that secretly ate. I was the one that binged. I was that person. I was essentially sugar. 
Yeah. And I never had that. There was no one out there that saw me for me but or do you bothered. think if you this book if you'd read this book when you were seventeen, do you think that you would have been helped by it? I don't think so. Because again it's making you think that you need this external person to change. Yeah. Does that make sense? So the change... Sometimes it does take a trigger though, doesn't it? It does. Don't get me wrong. I do think that the trigger for her is even and his friendship with her. But for all of those out there that don't necessarily get that, Mm. does that mean that I'm never going to be able to change? Yeah. And I think... It doesn't give me hope, if that makes sense. And in in a similar way, I wasn't the fat kid. I was extremely skinny because I was anorexic. So one extreme to the other for us. Yeah, I was the opposite. I saw... My mum was like her mama. She wasn't so fat that she stayed in bed all the time, but she... Put a lot of demands on you. Yeah, she's morbidly obese and she did put a lot of demands on me and I was at her beck and call for anything, drinks, whatever. And so that part of the story really resonated with me. And you're right... I wasn't. Ex- I never expected as a child to think that someone was going to come in rescue you on that but stallion. Still, no, but I still fantasized that about as a child when I was That's a teenager. Because of Disney, <laughs> I wanted someone to come and rescue. But that me. was Disney, wasn't it? That's yeah. this kind of expectation. Plus, also, I think you feel so worthless. You don't feel you can change things for yourself. I yeah. didn't feel I could stand up to them. And whenever I did stand up to them, we'd have these massive arguments and then nothing would change and I would be the bad guy. I was the one that caused the fight and then we'd all go back to where the way it was before where I was the bottom of the pile. Nothing ever changed. Mm. And it's only as an adult when I'm out of the situation that I can actually talk to my mum about what what it was like. And even then, I haven't told her everything. I can't tell mine what no. it was like. No. And so I do definitely think that when she gets to, spoiler alert, when she gets to the end of the book and she is able to step away with her brother's help, her other brother. Yeah, so after this sexual assault, she decides that she is no longer safe in her own home, in her bedroom, which is fair enough because about time she's actually taking something and going, you know what, this isn't right. And her older brother, who is no longer living at home, he is out living with his girlfriend says to Sugar, come and stay with me, get out of the house. And he's really, the dynamic between those two is completely different between her and Skunk. I mean, this brother is understanding. He knows what she's going through. He hates the fact that she's in this house and what her mama and Skunk are doing to her. But don't you feel that he ends up being that man on the white horse coming in and saving her? Oh, definitely. He's that that person that you hoped would it would happen to us. Yeah, but then we kind of had that in our own ways, if you get what I mean. So I moved out when I was 17 and I moved in with my grandma and she was kind of like that person. Yeah. And you had a different situation, but yeah, kind but of I moved similar. out into my boyfriend's yeah. house with his family. So in some ways we both took an escape route. Yeah. And Maybe it was coming from us, but maybe it also needed that. And I suppose not everything catalyst. can come from you. You do need a support system. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? Yeah. What are we? If you are a teenager and you have issues at home, where do you turn to for that support? I mean, yeah. And could you te- go to a school because well, you're obviously dealing with these yeah. kind of kids? But all then the I time. T- and I do talk to you about how yeah. some of the the students I deal with, you know, I deal with the pastoral system, so I do deal with social services and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I talk to you about how. It just feels like it's not enough. Mm. And as part of my job, there is a limit to what I can do. Of course, there's a limit to everything because that's the system that all of us have to be constrained by. Yeah, It's not like you can go and take all of these kids that are having issues at home to come and live with you, is it really? Let's be honest. Yeah. I can't even give them a hug sometimes when I want to. Yeah. You know, and you do think that actually there's some of them that you do want to take home and look after them because you know it would be better than what they've got when they go home. And I do struggle sometimes to think that I have no control over that. Like, well, you wouldn't be human if you didn't. No. I don't think. No. And and I think as well, because of the situation we had as well, I, I do. Sometimes it triggers my childhood when mm-hmm. I see what they're going through, how much I wish things would be different. Definitely. But at the end of the day, they are their parents. And until you are separate from them, there's not much that can be done. Unless 
someone like social services steps in, but they're then, reluctant to... But even then, they will only remove a child if there's a danger to that child, and that's a physical danger. Not an emotional danger. Yeah. Because otherwise we would have been taken away. Yeah. Let's be honest. Well, the, the problem is, is that then they'd be overrun. That's well, the of problem, course there because be. there's a lot more emotional damage going on than there, well, is, there is physical, I think. And unfortunately, in some ways, all parents... Even though, on the whole, most of them are trying their best. There are obviously occasions where this isn't the case. But for those that are out there trying their best, there is inevitable mess-ups and upsets that they can cause their child and scars that they cause their children without being aware. And you see this with Sugar. I don't think her mama, who is aware of how much damage she's doing to Sugar. No. But she's creating herself in Sugar. Yeah. A mini image of herself, this downtrodden woman. Yeah, that and feels the worthless. Is, parents dealing with their own medical and mental, mental health, health issues, issues, which they're not even aware of. Mm. That's I think that's the issue. If you're aware of your mental health issues and you're following all the guidelines and you are uh, getting Taking help medication and, and, and doing all those things, you know, you, can, you I think you can be extremely competent as a parent and probably more self aware than some parents. Whereas, like my mum has mental health issues. We know this, but she's not. She's not acknowledging it. No, she's not aware of that. But she, that's the other thing, isn't it? You have to have this motivation in yourself to do something about it. She's also a bit of a narcissist and narcissists find it very hard to change, don't they? Because mm. of that's part of being a narcissist. Mm. So I do think that my mum, like Sugar's mum, isn't aware of the issues that she is giving to Sugar. And actually, she almost doesn't seem to care She's more wrapped up in her own life than she is about giving any kind of consideration to her own child, Yeah, I think, in this case. Yeah, and I don't know what the American social services system is like. I can only know what the English one is like. But I I know that there is support for parents in those situations. So they would, you know, they can give you parenting classes. They can, social services can visit and make sure and give you advice on what you need to do. But But actually, she's 17 years old as well. So there is a limit. It's not like she's a child child. And in some ways, what gets to me personally is why aren't we covering certain things like this? in schools does that make sense i mean having relationships with other people knowing what is a good relationship what is an effective relationship what should be expected from a relationship like this mutual respect between people why aren't we teaching that kind of thing why are we so obsessed with maths grades and (laughs) history grades and not being i'm a history teacher (laughs) that's why i said it (laughs) but why are we so obsessed with academic achievement in comparison to, you know, being able to be a fully functional human being. But then it's also hard to get teenagers to 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 listen to that side of things because they yeah. don't realise it actually does it, it actually does mean something to some people. Yeah. So there'll be students you'll be teaching about it's mental true. health issues, which is why there's people like me in schools who goes in and deals with specific students, but it's only when we know what's going on. I know that at my school, there was one teacher that I told about what was going on, and that wasn't until I was in my last year of, of secondary school. And how did they even respond to that? Well, they were just... My mum worked at my school as well as a, a teaching assistant. So because of that, they all thought she was amazing because outside of the home, she was very helpful to people. She was very mm. nice. It was only inside the home where she treated me differently. So I, they were just surprised that that was the case. And they never did anything with that knowledge, though, but that I, I guess, know of. Yeah. You know, there was no one who sort of looked into... There was no advocate for you, really, Yeah, in some ways. But that's the thing. That's the thing that gets to me. Yeah. Is that with... The whole point is that as a child, you are reliant on that parent to look after you and nurture you and all of those kind of things. But what happens when it goes wrong? There's this huge... Don't get me wrong. Social services are doing the best job that they can. They are looking after kids. They are taking kids away they're in physical danger and i know that the other end of the system is when children need to be placed with other families and stuff that that is a again it's going to be difficult because how many families are going to be able to do it and all of those kind of things but there is kind of this gray area Mm. isn't there where there just isn't necessarily any help or support yeah i mean Should every family be in some kind of therapy in some ways? Well, I do think that in, I know 
in England, the idea of therapy is... Oh, stigmatised. Yeah. Hugely stigmatised. Yeah. And I try and break that down. I tell the kids that I, I see a counsellor yeah. and things like that because I think that it's important they know that, first of all, that adults are as screwed up as anyone else. And <laughs> also... <laughs> not more. <laughs> but actually asking for help is a strength. It's not a weakness. Yeah. And the problem is, is that they are taught that... First of all, we're all taught that we owe our parents something oh, growing yeah. up. So they looked after us. They brought us into this world. Well, I wasn't never yeah. asked to be here. Firstly, yeah. so just saying. so when you are, especially those children that are young carers, mm. you there is a sense of obligation to what yeah. you have to do. I think even more so mm. in some ways because in, your parent is reliant on you yeah. for certain self care reasons. Yeah, and that's another thing that kind of worries me if I was to ever be able to have my own family worries me as well with the fibromyalgia and with you with the MS you know if we were ill I wouldn't want to put that on a child it's unfair but then that's why there are people like carers that come in and help you and things like that that you can you know pay for and ask for and yeah in some cases get on our welfare system but I mean I can't have children and the other day I was at Asda and I saw this woman, I could hear her screaming and I wasn't anywhere near the front door of Asda. I was several car spaces back and I'm walking towards the front door to get into Asda because I needed some chocolate eggs. <laughs> it <laughs> I is like needed. I needed. <laughs> and I got there and what I saw made me want to cry. There was this little, I would say he was probably about three or four and his mother was in his face screaming at him because he was upset about something. She'd probably told him no and he was getting a bit stroppy about it. But literally, I sit there or I stood there and I was like, oh my God, people like that can have children. I see. Whereas... There are teachers that scream at children and, and I, I'm a teacher that doesn't believe that that works sometimes How does it work? the only the only times but then saying that sometimes you do get frustrated as a teacher and i'm enough. sure as a parent that sometimes if your kid isn't listening to you because but they as a don't three or four year old would you scream in their face literally she had bent down mm. she wasn't even you know like sometimes you get the towering parent above and yeah. telling them off no she was down on her knees in this little child's face literally screaming at him he's crying her yeah. face is bright red and you're like i can't do anything yeah what do you do about I, that? i couldn't do anything i mean if what you what can't even I... report that because you no. don't know who she is no. <laughs> well, there's that but i couldn't exactly go up to her and go what are you doing yeah. to your child because there's this barrier isn't there? there's also this fact that as someone also i don't have children being single and just i don't, don't want to do it on my own yet and there is that thing where parents say to you, you know, have you got kids? And I, as a teacher, say no. And that no. must be awful. And you, you must find it as well, though, that, there, you know, people do judge you when you don't have kids. Oh, because yeah. Because you don't have a right to, to criticise their parenting because you haven't got children yourself. When actually, as a teacher, I would say I actually have a lot of experience of kids and I used to nanny and, I, you know, I've looked after And we were there. We were those kids that were being screamed at for yeah. no reason. Yeah. I don't know, no reason that I could see. But yeah. we were the ones that really were emotionally neglected. Yeah, and I do think and that you if you'd said that. something, she would have been like, well, you'd have no right to judge me. Yeah. Because that's Who my child. Yeah. But actually, I think that we should, you know, maybe we should be the people that do walk up to that woman and say, what do you think you're doing? Yeah. And the thing is, I think, coming back to the story... With sorry. The, no, sorry. Um, coming back to the story with Sugar, I think that her mum isn't able to see her own issues and what she's doing to Sugar. Skunk doesn't care because he is, well, I think he's a narcissistic male dominant kind of role that he's been created by his family. Mm. So he isn't going to help her. So I think I was really pleased when her other brother came on the scene and was able to give her that escape route. Yeah. And get her out of that home so that she can then develop and see how, see how damaging it's been for her. Yeah. You know, and I th- I think that until you're outside of a situation, you don't necessarily see how bad it has yeah. been. So I do think that she needed that catalyst to give her the escape room. So that's really the book in a nutshell. So the, from the editor, there's a interesting piece that I found that basically talks about what the editor thought about the book 
during the editing phase and into obviously the publication. And there's some bits of this that I wanted to read out because I thought it would be interesting to discuss. And so the first paragraph in this section says, let's get something out of the way. As a protagonist, Sugar Legowski Garcia is not immediately likeable. When I first read this book's opening pages, I was so appalled that I nearly put down the manuscript. But something happened. It was as if a switch was flicked and the sparkling electricity of Sugar's voice took over. From that moment on, there was nothing I could do but continue reading, holding on to each word of Sugar's story as it unfurled before me. Okay, so overall, the paragraph's quite positive, but she's immediately not likeable. Yeah. That's the bit that gets to me, is why is she not likeable? Is it because she is, obviously she's narrating from her point of view, but is it because she is so downtrodden, she has no self-esteem, she's, what is it that's not likeable? I mean, I read the first part of this book and I went, oh my goodness, it's me on a page. Yeah. I wonder if it's because as a... As it's from Sugar's point of view, and she's a 17-year-old teenager who is caught up in what's going on, that at first she is complaining quite a lot about what's going on. She's But why shouldn't she? No, no, I agree. That was what I was getting to. It's actually, yeah, she why shouldn't she be? But she's in a if you've never been in a situation position. like this, I wonder if she came across as a bit at first just a complaining teenager. And then when you get to know her full story, it you then understand why she's a complaining teenager. Because actually out of all the complaining teenagers, you know, she has a right to complain. Yeah, but then we're automatically just putting a stereotype on this girl aren't we to say that well she's just a moany teenager and it's only until you get into the book that you then realize actually she has a reason to be like this and especially as i thought as an editor you would understand that actually a character isn't go is going to grow in a book yeah you can't tell all of the details in that first couple of paragraphs i mean the character develops and i don't quite understand I thought she was really likeable because really in the first part of the book it's talking about her dealing with her mother and it's them talking about how she deals with her brother and the fact that she has to do the shopping and all of that kind of stuff. It's almost a bit mundane actually in the way that she talks about her life and what's going on but then the beginning of a book is always about setting the scene you Mm. know and they often do say the first chapter of a book doesn't necessarily grip you it's actually there are many books that are amazing like for example the Harry Potter the first book Mm. if you read the first couple of chapters are a bit more mundane because it's setting the scene and that and actually it's only when the story gets going that you you actually then start buying into some of the characters and stuff. So mm. I think it's a bit, well, to use his own word or her own word, the naive to think that actually this character is meant to be likeable first thing off. That is true. That is true. Anyway, it just got to me because yeah. I was like, how could you're judging a book by its cover? You're not necessarily seeing the person behind the complaints. Yeah. And I think that also then goes on to the next point that this particular editor makes. And so again, I'm going to read this. It's a part of this particular editor's writing. It says, the ray of light in this mire is Sugar's singular perspective showing how she can love the mother who oppresses her expressing her naive hopes that a stranger might see past her obesity and surviving the dull, constant pain of her peers cruel ridicule yeah and this is the bit that i don't like the bit where he says expressing her naive hopes that a stranger might see past her obesity why is that naive to hope that someone's going to look beyond your layers of fat or whatever and see you as a real person because this i don't know i don't want to get i don't know this editor i don't know who this person is but it does seem quite upsetting that perhaps this particular person has their own preconceived ideas about fat people. Yeah. And that maybe they've had difficulties in the past with fat people. And yeah, I don't, I do not agree that it's fair to state that it's her naive hopes. However, I do feel that perhaps from my past, for me, I know that people didn't see past the fact. Does that make sense? So yeah. maybe it is a naive hope because well, I know in reality, that never happened for me. Yeah, but then I think maybe that's what we should be striving for. We should be striving to see people beyond their outer appearances and looking to who they are on the inside. Well, exactly. I mean, I was listening to a different podcast. Yes, there are other podcasts <laughs> and I listen to them. And I think it was the Psychology in Seattle. Available. Yeah, <laughs> the Psychology in Seattle podcast. And they were talking about online dating yeah. and how a woman who is very appeasing to the eye gets like 90% of 
all of the men messaging them and someone that looks more ordinary is really just ignored and not even stated and i guess probably the same goes for men as well oh i think so the opposite that the ladies or the women out there would go well he looks nice and it's this snap judgment that we're making and I know that stereotypes are there for a reason. They're there because it's easier for us to process the amount of information that is available. However, why is it that we have this preconceived idea that fat people are no good? Yeah. That's the thing that gets to me. Yeah, it's like you maybe because you it's felt you haven't looked after yourself. You haven't you haven't you know, strive to be healthy because I think there is a preconceived idea that fat means unhealthy, and it doesn't always. No, it doesn't. But then and also there's a multitude of other reasons exactly. why somebody is fat. It's not just because they don't want to be healthy. I mean, the reason why I eat slash still like when I was a younger, why I ate was because I constantly felt alone. And the only way that I knew how to self-soothe was to eat. And in that split second of eating, which you get to see when Sugar talks about Mm. her eating, she feels so much better once she's had that food. But then about five minutes later, she then beats herself up and she's critical of herself. And she's like, why did you do that? You're stupid, you're fat, all of those kind of things, which is exactly what was going through my mind every time I did this. Because I'm like, why am I doing this? This is just stupid. But... I'm there and I don't have the emotional support from family members, my parents, to be able to then deal with any emotion that I was feeling. Yeah. And I wasn't able to approach them and say, look, I'm feeling sad. Yeah. And I mean, I was anorexic, so I was considered the thin, healthy person. And actually, I was very unhealthy because I wasn't eating very much at all. And that was in a way I didn't want to become my obese mother so I took it as you know the opposite I would do anything to not be her and therefore I didn't eat because I didn't want to be her because eating meant that I could become fat and Mm. I could become her and so even now where I am now considered obese under the you know BMI standards I do beat myself up sometimes for for it and feel guilty we talked before this podcast about the fact that I've been buying the low fat ice cream because it makes Mm. me feel less guilty than if I want a scoop of full fat ice cream Mm, because I was saying that my husband has binged on quite a lot of ice cream I've gone I'm not going to buy anymore so that it may help him be able to reduce his ice cream intake because he has to physically go out and get that ice cream it's not just there in the house yeah and so for me by buying the cheap the sort of less calorie um, you know full stuff I'm actually trying to yes I can have the thing that I want because part of my eating is that I have to eat the things I kind of want because of the anorexia before but at the same time, it's not going to make me feel as guilty as if I ate a whole tub of the mm. absolutely adorable Ben and Jerry's. Yes. Which I love, but it's bad. I'm sorry. It's not bad. It's just the the quantity. quantity. <laughs> Everything in their own quantities. Yeah. And one spoonful of Ben and Jerry's should be enough, but it never is. Nor is one biscuit. No. So I think this has triggered a lot of our relationship with food. Oh, definitely. And it's a relationship that we both still struggle with now mm. in different ways, but both emotionally have soothed ourselves with with or with without food. Mm. Like now, I think I definitely am, I eat more when I'm sad or, you know, and things like that than I mm. did when I was younger. But that's because I was so driven not to be my mother, whereas now I've accepted I will never be her. But Although sometimes you do wobble. I do. And you have to have reassurances. Yeah. Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. No. It's just part of the process of me dealing with that. But I've got more acceptance than I used to have. Mm, definitely. So, yeah. I found the mother character the the hardest for me to deal with in the book. That's because she is almost your mum yeah. in real life. And the, the parallels between the two are just so obvious. Yeah. And I think also the fact that your issues were with your mother, whereas my issues were with my father. Yeah. So... I guess in some ways I was a little bit more removed yeah. from that. We have said the sugar character is kind of a combination of both of our childhoods. It's like the mother character epitomates what my mother was and sugar is kind of dealing with a lot of the issues that you dealt with. And then, you know, then you've got that the, the sexual assault, which I had, at, you know, I was a bit older than 17, but I, was, I wasn't much older. And so the whole combination of this is kind of 
of like it's what us we sort of had in a book, isn't it? It's just us. <laughs> and then book. we both actually moved out at seventeen to get away from the situations we were in, mm. not by a brother, but by different reasons. Yeah. So yeah, I think this book's really triggered a lot of what we felt as kids. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right. So should we move and have a look at some of the customer reviews that mm-hmm. you picked out? Yeah. Um. So Sydney picked out a load of reviews that criticise the book in different ways, and we thought we would talk about some of the things that they say and you know link it into the mental health issues that were going on as well. So the first one that I think we should probably discuss is that the storyline isn't believable and is one big cliche. Yeah. Which I think because maybe we lived through a this. combination of this <laughs> you know my life hopefully isn't a cliche <laughs> one <laughs> big cliche and actually i do believe this happen. i see this happen with kids at the school i you know i've been teaching at so i think that it maybe it's a bit naive of that person to have written that it's that it's un- it's not believable that actually maybe it's just that they've not experienced it and in some ways, they're lucky to have not yeah. experienced the emotional neglect, the physical abuse that we perhaps have felt more readily than this person. Because I wouldn't wish it on anyone yeah. at all. Yeah. And maybe the cliche is the fact that this is an experience that actually maybe is a bit more everyday story than some of the you know exciting stories and the mystical and the, the magical stories that, that other people read. So maybe mm. because it's more everyday, it seems more mundane yeah and to fit in but actually i felt that the fact that we do maybe link into this book because of what we went through actually makes it more believable but also more how to say it's it's more like actually this story needs to be told for people who are living through this Mm. and actually could read this i know we said that actually if we'd read it when we were that age i would probably have thought that at least i wasn't the only one yeah and you do feel i felt very lonely and very isolated as a child because of what was going on because i was made to feel i was the one that was picked on so Mm. by my family so i felt very alone yeah and so I do think, yeah, you're right. This book might have made me feel, actually, I'm not alone. There are other people that have this situation. My mother is not unique, unfortunately, in many ways. So maybe it seems like a cliche because it is actually, it's a story that it actually could does be reality. Happen. Yeah. Yeah. But then that doesn't fit with the same part where it says it isn't believable. No. <laughs> How can it be a cliche, which means that it actually is more realistic and then not believable? Yeah, it's a little confusing. See, now I would have thought if this was me, that if it had ended up the way I thought the book was going, so halfway through I thought, oh no, it's another love story, blah, 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 blah. But it didn't. Now that would have been a cliche. And that would have been unbelievable in some respects, because it's a cliche in the fact that all of these books that we've been reading end that way. But it's also not believable because in reality, love doesn't fix everything. Yeah. No, it's true. And there's another review that says that the beginning was more thought provoking than the end of the book. But actually, I found the other way around that actually the ending was more about was kind of more interesting in the way that she was able to get out than maybe yeah. the start. I think, you know, the start is setting it's the very scene. Much, yeah. it's, it's, it's getting you used to the characters. And, and I mean, to me, the middle was more, more important yeah. for me. But most books The are. whole twist yeah. really is the bit. Yeah. And how she deals with that twist because she meets even and as a result of her doing more walking and so on and so forth, she then starts to drop the weight. Yeah. And I think that's probably the bit that is more interesting. And then what happens when even dies? I mean, if it was me, I would go back to my old habits because that's how I deal with things. That is my mm-hmm. life. Whereas she has become so strong as an individual, she is able to continue along the same path she's already started yeah i mean you don't know if necessary after the book's well you don't know if she would have but you know we all have short term but in the short term she has definitely yeah stayed on that that path Mm. and it's for her and not for anybody else and she's not been bullied into trying to lose weight for anyone else she hasn't been told that she has to yeah and i think that leads on to the other another one of the reviews that we weren't convinced by where it says the characters are incredibly one-dimensional the mum is selfish and mean the brother is nasty sugar is super sweet and good-natured despite everything that's happened to her even is likewise good-natured despite adversity the pretty popular crowd is cruel blah 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 but that's life 
But I also don't think it's true. I mean, the things that we've talked about Sugar shows that she is not a one-dimensional character. No, that's true. I do think perhaps Mama is a bit of a one-dimensional character, just but purely because she's not in the book as much. Yeah, but I also think it's because the book is written from Sugar's point of view, and we see our parents in a particular very, way. Yeah, and so... You're not going to be objective, are you? No. She's not going to give her mother's life story and explain why. I mean, it took me 30 years to get the counselling that I needed to actually accept why my mother is the way she is. Mm. And it is to do with her backstory. But, yes, your but, mum's backstory is extremely emotional. Yeah. And accepting that actually it doesn't it doesn't condone what she did, but it might it just makes acceptance easier yeah but actually it's taken me 30 years to realize that at the age of 17 there's no way even though i knew some of the stuff that happened in my mum's history you would equate the two together you're just not at that stage are you so i think that because this book comes from her point of view of course her brother is just nasty just nasty and actually some people are just nasty and some people are very one-dimensional in that way and second of all we've got the mother who seems very selfish and mean well actually maybe that's because she is because yeah. of her past and just because the story's not about her. Yeah, so that's true. That is very true. And I guess Sugar is super sweet and good natured. I don't know about you, but I didn't exactly... I assumed that I wasn't that bad. I mean, my dad has made comments that I was quite angry as a teenager. Yeah, but he but doesn't then... have the right perspective. My parents tell me I was the worst teenager. I was the hardest to bring up. I was angry. Of course I was angry. Because they made you angry because of the way that they treated you. I was the one that always started the arguments. Well, yeah, I did start arguments because I wasn't happy with the way I was being treated. Mm. And actually, I just got knocked back down, as we did. Mm. So their understanding of what we were like is actually is one-dimensional from yeah. their point of view. And actually, they don't understand what we were like. I, You know, I'm actually with I, friends, a very kind and generous person, as you are as well. And they don't see that side because they're just using you. So they don't see the kind generous because they expect it. Mm. Yeah, true. They expect us to come in on our white horses and fix all of their problems. Yeah, so they don't see it as kindness and generosity. It's just what you expect to be done. Mm. So they can't see that that other aspect of it. That's true. So I think that actually thinking from a perspective, you know, the parents, our parents are never going to really understand what we were like at that age. No. Because they can't see beyond what they expected. And what they saw. Yeah. And we were brought up that, you know, you do everything that you were meant to do because they brought you into this world. And apparently that means that you you can expect anything from your children. Yeah, that is true. So I think that's the same with this. That the mother doesn't see how nice sugar is. Because... Or identifies how much sugar is actually doing. I mean, that's the mm, issue. True. Like with my dad is the fact that I cooked, I cleaned and I did all of this stuff. But yet he would go around telling everyone that he did everything. And actually it was me. Yeah. My mother used to say to my nan, oh yeah, we'll come over and clean your windows uh, um, during the Easter holidays. And then of course that was me and my sister cleaning the windows and... My sister then going off and playing and, and me cleaning the windows and my mum sitting there having a nice cup of tea with my nan. As you do. But then she'd go, oh yeah, we did that over the holidays. We didn't do anything. Mm. But that is the royal we, as I say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure the Queen's lovely and she doesn't expect you to clean her windows. But well, she might. You she never might. know. But yeah, my nan used to say thank you and recognise that it was me. Yeah. But yeah. Not your mum. Not my mum. Mm. Just like she used to give the money to say thank you to me rather than to my mother, because she knew I would never see it. Oh, yeah, because they would just take it and spend it. Well, they did it. Of course they did. Just like she did my GCSEs. She's the reason I'm successful. You know, it's not, but that's their perspective. Mm. So, yeah, I do think, though, that I think to say the characters are one-dimensional, I think it's it's not fully understanding what the The story is about. And, well, I'm not understanding the perspective the story is from, Mm. I think, and understanding maybe the teenage brain a little bit. Yeah, I think that's probably something, (laughs) maybe this was an adult reading it and they haven't quite understood that it's from a teenage perspective. And we are different as teenagers. I mean, if I knew what I know now as a teenager, I don't think I would be in the mess that I am in now, if that makes sense. I'd have left home at about 10. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, hindsight is a wonderful thing. Isn't isn't it? it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's true. And especially, I mean, if I'd been in counselling from a young age, I definitely think things would have been different. But 
it wasn't on offer. No one recognised that I needed it. And I wouldn't have qualified even for it anyway. Well, this is why I'm saying that, I don't know, maybe it should be some kind of thing that parents and children have regular sessions with an external person to talk through their problems and to talk yeah. through their issues. Because it's obvious that the poor children may not be there. There's no advocate for them because the parents are too wrapped up in themselves. And I'm not saying this is all parents and I'm not saying that everyone should do this, but I think it would have made some kind of difference yeah. if this had happened for me. Yeah, I also think, unfortunately, when you do need counselling as a teenager, when we've tried to get it for people... You can't get it. You, we can't get it. You have to be of a, such a high criteria to get it because they're so overstretched and they're using a lot of charities to help support that. But even the charities are overstretched because there is just so much out there. And I think if you actually, I think, had teachers trained as counsellors in mm. their part of your teacher training was to to actually be uh, to train as a counsellor, even just a basic counselling mm. course, I think that teachers could then mentor children in a maybe a more, uh, in a better way in cases and understand the right questions to ask and the right times to listen. Mm. And I do think that actually, you know, the biggest thing teenagers want is to be heard. And to be understood. Yeah. And those are the two things they struggle with. And a lot of teachers shut them down quite mm. early when they want to talk because they don't want to hear it. And, and a lot of teachers, you know, I always say there's almost two types of teacher. There's a teacher that gets into teaching because they want to work with kids. And then there's a teacher that gets into teaching because they want to teach their their subject. subject. I'm one that love my subject completely, don't get me wrong, but I got into teaching because I wanted to work with kids. And so I want to do the pastoral stuff. I want to go and talk to them about what's going on at home because of my own childhood. Mm. You know, I want to tell them what happened to me so that hopefully they'll realise that you can go beyond what you're expected of and all that kind of stuff. But not all teachers are like that or want to be like that because they come in, they want to teach their subject and they, they you know, kind of want to go home. And I do think that if teachers actually did have a bit more counseling counseling training at least then they would be able to recognize when people need to talk maybe mm, yeah and what questions to ask to be able to get that out of them as well because yeah. it's difficult it's if you have a child or a teenager that doesn't want to talk how do you get them to talk and i'm guessing you probably don't do any of that kind of stuff in teacher training not at all and and actually i mean i'm thinking of a particular student but i have one that you know he doesn't want to talk to anybody and shuts down when anyone tries to talk to him and you know even though little and often we might be breaking him down but you you know he just shuts down and doesn't want to talk and you do kind of go partly they think as a teenager you think that actually if I forget about it I won't have to deal with it mm. and at some point it will all come back but I think we're also living in a culture especially for men unfortunately that actually it's not about talking and although those barriers are being broken down it's taking a long time and so there are a lot of boys out there young men and men who feel that if you talk about your problems or your emotions or have emotions yeah that you're weak and there's something wrong with you yeah mm. And I think although the male stereotypes are being broken down in some ways, again, also being more emotional has been linked to being homosexual. And mm. so there's a there's a connotation there that actually some students have said to me, oh, you know, I don't want to talk about it. I'm not gay or whatever. And although I then explain to them that that's it's not, not the about it is, being that, gay. you know, it shows you the perception that they have. Mm. And I do think that those are the things. And that's one of the reasons we do this podcast is because we want to try and break those barriers down and say, it's not about that. Actually, talking is helpful. Yeah. Talking actually, you know, something that actually women are more inclined to do because, you know, of, of the way that we socialize compared to boys and men. You know, because of the way that we socialize, we do talk more, but then we don't necessarily talk about the right things. I don't know. Probably not. Not always. No. If I think back, I mean, I'm much more open about it now since I've had the counselling and we've done the podcast and we've really wanted to push about mental health and breaking down those barriers. So we talk a lot more about it. But if you go back to... I don't think it's a routine thing, is it? It's not like it's a conversation starter. Oh, by the <laughs> way, I think I'm depressed. Well, no, you think we've been friends for a long time now. We uh, met when I was, what, 20, I must have been, 21. Yeah. And so, we, you know... We've and been... we're old now. <laughs> and I 
wouldn't have known about your mental health issues probably for a couple of years that we then started talking because I saw some of it because we mm. were supporting you. And then maybe it took time because we took time to become friends, but... I didn't let anyone in either. No. And then that's maybe what I'm going to. Actually, even when women do talk, we don't necessarily talk about the... We talk know. about the weather. Yeah. No, we're joking. <laughs> Fashion. All, all we do is talk about <laughs> men and... <laughs> no, 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 but it, we don't necessarily talk about mental health. It's not a, to- a, a normal topic, though, is it? No. It's not considered social those... etiquette. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Even said, with your closest a, friends, it's not a conversation starter. Oh, by <laughs> the way, I self harmed. What does? I think also the the shock and the the reaction of that other person. If yeah. I was to randomly go to someone in the street and go, "I self harm," or "I have self harmed," the yeah. look of sheer panic in their face is like, "Oh my god, are you going to hurt me?" Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah. my goodness, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Like, how do I even deal with that? Yeah. And I think that's also another issue is that people are scared about saying or doing the wrong thing. All I wanted was for someone to listen to me. Especially as a part of when you have a mental health issue, you worry about being judged a lot, I think. Mm. And that's because there is a lot of judgment out there. And a lot of stigma with that judgment. Yeah. yeah. But I think it becomes almost like a cycle of you're scared to be judged you don't want to be judged. People are being so judged. Yeah. So you don't say anything. So then you're more scared of being du- judged. And and it's kind of a cycle of actually, it, I'm not sure whether it is actually because you're going to be judged or whether it's because you think you're going to be judged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you end up in this kind of like, my brain's going to explode. <laughs> I love the fact that there's that new emoji now that's got like the, the blade exploding. exploding. I love that one. <laughs> that is my favorite. I'm just like, yeah, brain exploding. Yeah. It makes my head hurt just thinking about the cycle that yeah. you could or do end up in yeah especially if most people with mental health do suffer with anxiety and it's one of the biggest symptoms because of the worry that comes with i think the judgment and because of how people are going to react with you how all of the society is going to interact with you so i do think that that anxiety stops you from talking Mm. And therefore, then you worry about it and then you worry some more and then you worry some more. And then by that point, you've built walls so high, you're not going to turn anyone. Yeah, definitely. So hopefully these kind of podcasts, you know, if you can listen to us just telling you that it's okay to talk about it. um, It is okay to talk about it. It is. There are people out there that will listen. Yeah. Including us. And And actually, if I spoke to some of my closest friends, which I do and tell them I'm struggling with my mental health and things like that, and they didn't support me, and they just judged me in a bad, negative way. Maybe they're not the kind of friends you want in your life. No, that's so true. And I often, you know, think about that. I'm really lucky for the friends I have, because you guys do support me. And I don't know, it depends how I'm feeling. <laughs> you do support me, <laughs> and, you know, are there for me when I need it, and when I don't need it, or when I'm not asking as well. <laughs> um, but that's, you know, that's us. And it's taken us a long time to get the right friends mm. to have the right support. In comparison to family support, which yeah. is non-existent. And hopefully family can be there for you. You know, I'm lucky I've got my sister-in-law now who is much more supportive of me than mm. any member of my actual blood family. And is now starting to see some of the traits appear. Because in some ways they've kind of been on their best behaviour. Well, my they? family your family yes. <laughs> and now all of a sudden she's starting to see the cracks appear in your in your family yes particularly with certain relationships between siblings and stuff yeah and definitely. i don't know she's an only child so i think in some way she was a little shocked by these interactions that she's now seeing yeah i do think so i think it's she's seen she has seen her mother deal with her siblings but she's never seen yeah siblings direct dealing with sibling siblings. sibling interaction at, at her age as well with her sort of connotations of what life has been like for them because you'd come home sometimes go oh, they're a different generation, generation. Yeah. yeah generation differences so people of her generation and the way that yeah we interact and and especially with my sister who i don't have the best relationship with and i've never... and it's not through the fact that you're not trying to have a relationship with her it's the fact that she in some ways sees you as maybe some competition or something i'm not 100 percent sure about what it is that gets in the way there's some kind of barrier somehow i get her back up with Without doing anything and I don't know opening your mouth yeah I don't know what it is breathing I've done. and I've offered her to talk about it I've offered to to break things down I try and I get nothing back so I've got to the point where I said to her look I'm there I'm open whenever you're ready I'm there but at the end of the day I can't 
carry on running around like I have for the last 30 years trying to say love me love me love me which is a healthier place to be in yeah but for my sister-in-law coming into this she had a very good relationship with my sister to begin with and then that's broken down over Over time isn't it yeah sort of six months or so and because of things that my sister is and then done or brought up Mm. and things like that and and actually she's then more understanding for how I feel about things because of that, which has made things even better. Even there's now my, someone on your side. Really. Yeah, even my even when it came to my brother, because I also think my siblings were brought up to to un, to believe that I was the bottom of the pile, that I was the bottom of the family. My sister called me the runt for many years, you know, and I'm the middle child. I'm not the youngest, but of course I was the skinniest and the smallest. So she called me got runt. hurt the most. Yeah, she she called me the runt, but also I was the one that was the bottom of the pile. I was the one that had to do everything for everyone else. So they were brought up to, again, see the things I was doing for them as things that I should do rather than things that are actually more of a kindness. So now when I do things for my brother, for example, at first he kind of just expected me to help because that's what I've always done. Whereas actually his wife has gone, you know, that's really nice of her to do that. She doesn't have to do that and almost taught him to appreciate me more because actually not to expect me to do things and actually to it's unfair to expect yeah Mm. and actually realize that i am a kind generous person because again they didn't see me as necessarily as kind as generous as i am and i don't mean to sound like i'm pulling my you know blowing my own trumpet about how kind i am she so is (laughs) but i am I, i do like to think of myself as a kind generous person and so <laughs> I was you joking. Know, I know. Just in I case know. anyone out there gets offended. No, I was joking, <laughs> and, and I totally understand that. So he now sees me more as a kind and generous person because he doesn't. He does. He sees that those things I've always done shouldn't just be expected. Yeah, yeah. So I, with him, I've been able to break down those barriers that we were talking about with our parents. How they never see us like that. Actually, mm. his wife has helped him to actually yeah. get to a point where he can see that the things I do for him are actually you know on top of what i have to do yeah definitely because i want to yeah you know so yeah i can't remember even the review that we were doing (laughs) (laughs) never mind so the next one that i thought we i would pull up on is that it's kind of related in some ways it says unrealistic because there's not just one fat girl that is at high school to bully and again it's told from Sugar's perspective. Yeah, we don't know how many kids at the school have also felt been that they've bullied. been bullied. Exactly. Yeah. I think some of these are perhaps a little harsh. But Especially the one is when you're being bullied, you do feel very isolated. Oh, yeah. And you're and remember I've said before, when you have some kind of mental health issue, you tend to focus inwards because that's the way that you survive and that's the way that you get through this why would she be considering other people out there and also it doesn't matter if other people are being bullied if you're being bullied you're being bullied bullied. i mean you can't really take it doesn't matter if there's one person at the school or 50 people at the school if you're being bullied you deserve to have those feelings and it's almost right off the fact that well if everyone's being bullied then why should she complain about it yeah exactly which i think is a little bit harsh (laughs) the other one that really got to me was someone wrote that this reads like a person who has never been fat and it sounds insincere fat girls deserve stories where people like them get to experience love they deserve stories where they aren't the punchline they deserve stories where they are being told that they can be both fat and beautiful it is possible by the way i was really hoping that this would be a story where the fat girl doesn't have to lose a bunch of weight at the end to feel like she is worth a damn after sugar has magically transformed herself into a curvy girl with fat only in the right places she only then suddenly realises that weight doesn't really matter. Well, I think it's limited to say that that's the only reason at the end that she feels that the weight doesn't matter. It's not just because she's lost the weight, it's because she's actually been seen by somebody. And she's had now this traumatic life experience where yeah. she has lost the boy that she loves or the, the teenager, the guy that she loves. Yeah, and actually I think she does lose some of the weight because she is eating better. But and I think because she's doing more exercise, but it's not a conscious choice, I don't think. I think it's partly because she's not in the middle of a situation where she is being presented with this food all yeah. the time. She's not doing the shopping in the. And well, the she is, but she's actually got someone who's supporting her yeah. and her emotional needs. Yeah. Whereas she never had that before. So she doesn't need the food to make her yeah. feel like 
Well, yeah, because for to her, her, you know, food was a coping mechanism yeah. that she put in place without even realising it. Yeah. And so she doesn't need that coping mechanism as much. Because Therefore, she's now got even. She is likely to lose weight because she's not eating as much because she's not feeling she needs to as much. Yeah. So I think that that review has taken a very simplistic view of the book. And to say that, you know, it reads like someone who's never been fat. I felt that it was almost my life. <laughs> written down on a page. And I agree that fat girls do deserve stories about them being able to experience love no matter their size. But that's not the point of but this book. But that's not exactly that that you need to read a different book for that because and this actually is not we don't that. want the happy ending because we always complain about that well, love makes everyone happy. Exactly. And don't get me wrong, stories and fiction need to have a beginning, middle and end. And some people expect this happy ending, but life isn't always like that. Mm. And She does get a happier ending. But it's still not 100% happy. She doesn't have even anymore. No, it's very sad. That so, but yeah. It was a good twist that she doesn't. And I think, I think that's so. A, yeah, he, he didn't love her as uh, romantically, but he did love her as a friend. But then she finds the letter. Do you remember the letter that mm. confesses his love to her? Yeah. But he never had the courage to tell her. Yeah. So he did, you know, I do think it's teenagers again, how much can, this is the other thing I think is actually when it's that teenage love that we as adults, you know. We forget that it was so intoxicating when we were that age. And I mean, we, we've spoken about this before because I'm like, how can someone just fall in love instantaneously like this in these books? And it's like they're a teenager. They're teenagers. <laughs> And I, I guess that's something they wear that their I emotions forget. everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> they, they wear their emotions on their hormonal spikes <laughs> that keep popping out of everywhere. But yeah, it's something that you forget is that it is so intense when you are that age. Mm. And but then maybe I think because back, I was never there, I never had this realization yeah. or anything. See, if I when I think back, my first serious boyfriend I dated, and I was thinking about this the other day, and I was thinking. I felt like I was with him for a lifetime, like no, for mm. years. And I think it was only like, I look back and I looked at it and I think it's only about three or four months. Mm. And to me, like it was so serious and there was so much going on and it was so intense that it mm. felt so much, much bigger. And mm. at that point I was, you know, what sugar's age, 17. I was mm. around that age. And I think actually, and for several of those months, he went off to army training. So he wasn't even around. We just wrote letters to each other. Oh, I know. Very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> it's much more romantic back then. But it is, it, if you, when I think back to that love that I had for him, you know, and it was puppy love. It was that teenage first time ever love. It was probably a bit like, yes, in there. Someone had really seen me for who for you were, was. not anything yeah. else. Yeah. And seen me as someone who was attractive, even though I didn't feel it. And so, you know, it was supporting, boosting my ego a little bit. And it also helped me to get away from home life because mm. I was going out a bit more to see to see him and stuff. So all of that were built in, but it was so intense that it feels like that. And I see it at school sometimes when, you know, they go, oh, you know, I'm with this, with this person and they're with them for like a day. And <laughs> it's this, but it's a relationship. And actually, if you met someone and you said you were in a relationship by the end of the day, yeah, you know, I think they would be running for the hills. Yeah, and but it's so much more intense when you are that age. Mm. It it feels so much bigger than than it would if you took them out of that age and shoved them in ten years later. Yeah. Well, for me, I was the fat girl, so no one really paid me any attention. So I didn't really have any relationships, proper relationships or serious relationships, until I was at university. But even if you think of your first university relationship, how long was that compared to how long it felt? Because your first yeah, relationship... Yeah, no, it, it felt... Yeah, no, it felt how long it actually was. Yeah. I okay. think it's because I was older, though. Yeah. I wasn't... 17. Deep in hormones. hormonal... Yeah. Whilst there was still, obviously, brain changes and stuff going yeah. on, I was a bit more older and had a li bit, a little bit more life experience. Yeah. No, so, yeah, when I was 17, it felt... Yeah, the three or four months that it was. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> oh, the oh, stories. Dear. I think yeah. back and I cringe but at some of it. But yeah, it was what it needed to be at the time. And I think that's... The... I missed that. Missed all of that. Yeah. That's because I was the fat girl. Yeah, maybe. Oh, I think it certainly was. Because mm. I think I was nice and caring and... My best friend at school, though, 
she was overweight and she still found more when we were at college but then boys didn't really pay me attention until I left school and I went to college that's when I started having relationships when when I went I'd to college that. my first day I was about to get a drink from the vending machine and this guy walks up and goes nice tits shame about the face that's what I got when I went to that's college horrendous. isn't it the fact that you know that they could even com- if comment on somebody those was going things, to and it's still that. in my head of course why would it, I can see exactly why it is still in your head because that is outrageous. Yeah, that's the kind of thing I dealt with oh. as a teenager. See, whereas when I was a teenager, because I was super skinny and feeling worthless, me and my group of friends were very well known for going to the parties and oh, um, your party stories are drinking outrageous and maybe showing more flesh than we should so therefore we then got attention so i was getting attention for the wrong reasons and Mm. i was attracting the boys for the wrong reasons and now looking back i know it was because my self-esteem was so low i needed to do anything Anything. you just needed some attention from someone anyone someone to show me some love because i wasn't getting that love and i felt unloved at home a bit like i never so i never felt that that conditional love that you should feel from your parents yeah, I always I felt that I it was always conditioned. It was never unconditional. Yeah, you 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 can have some love if you do the vacuuming. Yeah, you can so have some I love if you do with the cooking. boys. That's how you did it. That's what life was like. I you needed to show a bit so I, that they yeah, would yeah pay you attention. Yeah, I had to drink the and get a bit drunk and a bit tipsy to then and get a bit outrageous. Yeah, to allow them to to actually get them to appeal, appeal to me to them, them to, to yeah be feel my find me appealing. Yeah. And I know that's not probably what was going (laughs) through their teenage boy head, but... They were just like, girls, 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 let's be honest. Especially as, you know, I was the exact opposite to to your boob story. I had (laughs) pancakes at that age. Because I was anorexic, I stopped all of that growth. Yeah. And it was only when I started eating again at 18. And then suddenly, because your boobs stopped growing at 21. So I only got three years of growth in there. If whereas, only I'd known. That's I know. all I needed to do. <laughs> all. <laughs> whereas yeah, my all si- I needed to do was to starve myself. Yeah. Whereas yeah. my sister, yeah, she started developing quite early. And everyone in my family, if you look at yes. all the women, are very big breasted apart from me. And that's because I stunted my own growth. That's not healthy. That's no. not, that's it's not, not something the to wish for. solution, <laughs> really, is it? But it's it's what happened to me. And, mm. and so I don't have a, you know, I have a reasonable chest, but nothing, uh, you know, maybe to write home to. <laughs> hey, I, w- I would ha- take yours any day. <laughs> uh, serious. Um, so the final criticism. <laughs> let's move yeah, on. <laughs> let's move on quick before uh, someone from starts my writing boobs. going, someone likes Becky's boobs. <laughs> <laughs> so just one factual thing is that we find out that Sugar's dad, who is Puerto Rican, has been deported, according to the book. That's what the book says, from America. However... When you look into that a bit more, because I didn't know this, and apparently not a lot of Americans know this either, (laughs) that if you are from Puerto Rico, you are considered to be a US citizen. So you are legally, you are a US citizen. So therefore, how can you really be deported from America to America? Yeah, and you fact-checked this. So this is from the 2nd of March, 1917. There was a jones Shafroff Act, which was signed, and that meant that anyone from Puerto Puerto Rico Rico was actually a US citizen. 41% of Americans apparently don't believe this, says statistics that we didn't make up, and 15% 15%. aren't sure, which means only 44% of Americans actually know this is true. Which well, is just under half. We didn't. Probably. I didn't know. We didn't know. We... But then we're not necessarily into the American political situation. But I think that's quite interesting that something like this could sneak into a book. So obviously mm. the editor didn't know. No. Either because they would. I would have thought they, they would have picked it up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that was an in, that was a, something that came out of the reviews. That and I do think. That that is an issue, particularly when you are storytelling, that if you get some kind of thing like that wrong, it can pull people out of the story that you're trying to tell. So, for example, I've got another book that does this, and I love this author, Jonathan Stroud. He wrote the Bartimaeus trilogy, and he then did another book that is about Bartimaeus earlier on in his journey. And he's meant to be around the time of the King of Solomon. And he makes a reference to some skeletons dancing like they were dancing to a honky-tonk piano. And that pulls me straight out the story every time. 
because in Solomon's time, there was no honky-tonk <laughs> piano. You can't liken the skeletons bouncing around to that if you're meant to be back in that time. It's yeah. just one of my bugbears. So it's just something that I would point out is that if you are going to be writing, if there's something that you're not sure about, always check it just to make sure you're 100% correct because it does impact the way people enjoy what you've written. Yeah. So that was sugar. <laughs> so as we said, we quite enjoyed it. We don't necessarily agree with most of the criticisms and this is what we think of this book. We will be doing an episode about eating disorders with The Secret Psychiatrist, which will be out next week. If you like this podcast, please, please, please tell your friends and family about us. We would so appreciate it if you did. If you want to follow what we're up getting up to, we both have Twitter accounts. I will put this in the show notes for you. We also have the Mental Health Book Club Twitter account, which is MHBC underscore podcast. We now have an Instagram. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that. I haven't, but I will We now have an out. Instagram. Come on now. <laughs> uh, which is all, I think it's MHBC pod. And we have our Facebook. And if you have any questions, just let us know. We will like to say that you guys have got to remember that it's okay to not be okay. And if you're not okay, it's okay to talk about it. Exactly. And we're here if you don't know where to go. Thank you very much for listening. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Mental Health Book Club podcast. If you need additional help with your mental health, please contact the Samaritans on 116 123, which is a 24-hour helpline. And if you need additional information about mental health issues, please visit MIND at mind.org.uk. Our next episode with The Secret Psychiatrist will be about eating disorders. And our next book will be 13 Reasons Why by Jay Asher. If you'd like to find out more about the MHBC podcast, please visit our website, mentalhealthbookclub.com. We really hope that you enjoy this podcast and we would like to hear what you think. Please head over to Twitter, follow us at MHBC underscore podcast or head over to Facebook and follow our Facebook page, which is Mental Health Book Club. If you would like to show your support further, please share us with your family and friends and leave us a five star review wherever you get your podcasts. We are now on Patreon please head over to patreon.com forward slash MHBC to donate as little as $2 a month to the Mental Health Book Club podcast. As a result of your donation, you will get early access to some of our episodes. You will get specific episodes that are only for patrons and you'll be eligible to be entered into free prize draws.